Okay. You're recording now. You're recording. He's the official recorder. recorder. Was he wearing an outfit that was roughly the same color? Yes. Yeah, I know. I was Or maybe we'll do it. It's on 6.30 right now. That's okay. We'll go back here. I got right and what I got wrong. Okay. You want? Is it already running? You're good. Go. You're good to go. Right here. Gentlemen, my name is Rob Young. I have the privilege of serving as the historian at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center at Wright Patterson. I've been there for 20 years. Um, what does a, a historian do there? I, I normally write top secret code word histories of what NASIC does. Uh, it's, it's great. I, 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 love, I love my job. But part of the heritage of, uh, of my position is that we were the unit down through history that, uh, that studied bad guy stuff, whether it be, you know, MIGs, which we've had plenty of come through right back over the years, um, or German equipment. You know, there, there were... There were uh, German <coughs> Focke-Wolfs and Japanese Zeros and ME-262s flying in the skies over uh, over Wright Path, um, over Dayton, you know, all those years ago. Uh, Med MiG-15 in the museum flew in the skies over Dayton. So I've gotten the opportunity over the years to, oh, gain a little bit of expertise <laughs> on, uh, on foreign equipment. Sometimes I get up close and personal. Um, that's not really the case with the V-2, as you can imagine. Um, the, uh, the, the V-2 in early Soviet space, this is something that I started years ago when one of my senior intelligence analysts' daughter asked me to come speak at Bellbrook Middle School <laughs> and on this topic. Could you come and speak on the German V-2 in early you know, Soviet space? She had, she had a project or something, and of course her dad was a, a big wig, and he's like, hey Rob, could you do me a favor? So, sure, sorry. I will be happy to, to, to you know, come up with something. So, that's how I got into the V2. Now, the T2 Intelligence, our unit back in those days, uh, yes, we were involved in the collection of... Uh, of the, the foreign equipment and the documentation. Because guys, there was over a thousand tons of German documents and you know maps and drawings and just all kinds of things that photos that had to be brought back, had to be translated, and our, our unit was was very much involved in all that. Um, the one thing I don't have, I don't have the primary documentation. I don't have the original cool V2 stuff. So a lot of that did not come here, you understand. A lot of it, where, where'd the missiles go? They went to White Sands, right? They went to Texas, they went to White Sands. And so I have a picture in here of a V-2 at right field. But it wasn't really, uh, they, they weren't really exploited here. Uh, they were studied in other places. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the V-2. We'll start with the museum's V-2. So, you know, get an opportunity. Go, go look at it. It's beautiful. As we were saying before, absolutely beautiful. You look at this thing, this is the Meiderwagen, right? Mm -hmm. the, your, your, your transporter erector. There are three. There are three left in existence that I have read about. One in Australia, one in Great Britain, and this one. They don't so, have any in the Soviet Union? That's, that's the three that, that I was able to find on they must have some artifacts. Oh, you can someplace. imagine. A Soviet, well, I don't know. They might have turned them in. They might have melted them and turned them into something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they might have, you know. <laughs> where the Berean, yeah, they're absolutely the beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> when you go look at it, when you get on the other side, look at the, the ladder that goes up. They have all the, the steel rungs that go up. Oh, the, the, the erecting arm, that's what it is. It's a ladder. I was why would they have one of the I know, okay. it's neat. We'll talk more about that yeah. in a little bit. It, but it, this, one, on space this one looks much smoother than my recollection of the one in, in Munich. Is that, is that correct? 
Cosmosphere did, as we were saying earlier, the Kansas Cosmosphere did the restoration. They did a beautiful job. This is what it looked like at Ashley. Wow. And yeah, no, you can see into it. There's like raccoons living in there. You know, look at that thing. Oh, man. One of the cool things, guys, that I came across in my research was they found all kinds of bullet holes in this thing. Now, I had heard that years ago, and of course, you and I would think um, airstrike, right? Because they were on a train to get them to the launch area, they would carry them on trains. And then a, and a, a crane would take them off and, you know, and then they would end up on the Mylar Wagen and then they would go do their thing. But this one had, had bullet holes in it. It had a 50 caliber round in the fuel tank, in the ethanol tank that they're looking at. And they go back to the, you know, the historical uh, beginnings where this thing came from. And there's a story of a tank. I assume a Sherman, you know, pulls out of the woods. There's, there's the train. <laughs> And he just lets it have it. I don't know. I, I don't know whether it was with the Top Gun or yeah. with or with a little ball gun, you know. In the front. Yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. It was if it was a fifty, it would have been the Top Gun, really, because that that was a thirty, if I remember correctly, in the, yeah, the lower side of the tank. But and and so this thing was was uh, pillaged by a by a Sherman tank, and that's the story. And so, you know, so, it, 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 it had holes in every section, holes in every section. So, Cosmosphere takes the thing, takes the modern wagon, and they make it beautiful. Um, I, <clears throat> I do Intel tours. Um, I started this years ago. I don't work in a museum, you understand. Uh, I work for NASIC, but I've had plenty of, plenty of opportunity over the years. I have visitors come, uh, and... Uh, I get the opportunity to take them to the museum, and I just talk intelligence. Uh, it's on their website, actually, at least up through World War II, so if you ever want to look. It didn't work last time I tried it, but I'm the, I'm the uh, ISR podcast. It's actually got my voice, and I've got my script. And eh. Anyway, talks a bit about this stuff. But um, uh, I love stopping here. I love it because I, I love to talk about the system because it is something... It, it, it's amazing how you have an individual that, you know, this, it wasn't Werner von Braun's goal to blast into smithereens other human beings. What was his goal? To go, yes. to, go to space. And remember, he got arrested. That's That's where the money came from. He got arrested by the, by the, like the, the Gestapo for, for, for even talking about you know, yeah, hey, well, this is going to get us into space someday. You know, like, what? And so, um, Werner von Braun is, is incredible. You know, um, he did things, invented things that experts, Lord Sherwell, I don't know, you know Frederick Lindemann, you know, Charwell. Sci Charwell, Sherwell? I think, I think it's Charwell, isn't it? I, I want to say C H E R. Yeah, the, the English, Charwell? Talk, the English talk English. Oh, Fred. Fred Landemann. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the scientific advisor to, um, to uh, Winston Church, Churchill. Very controversial guy. Uh, you know, he, he was one of those guys saying, you know, when, when, when our analysts, when the analysts were seeing a rocket on the ground, he was saying, ah, oh, that's not it. Because it would have to be solid propellant. And it's going to be like an 80 ton, you know, it's going to be huge. It's going to be for, for it to hit London. And so he <coughs> didn't get it. He didn't understand that this guy could come up with a turbo pump, you know, using, using ME 163, using, using comet fuel, you know, to, to, to drive a turbo pump to, to just. Oh, just the pump. Yes. Spew, like just the pump. And then the combustion chamber. Oh my gosh, it's 4,500 to 4,900 degrees. Guys, the, 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 the surface of the sun is 10,000. It's half the, half the temperature of the, the surface of the sun. And yet, you know, they develop that double wall combustion chamber. And you go, go look at it. It's in, it's in the, the missile. It's in the missile gallery. I'm sure you guys have been in there, you know, with give, give, you know, this group. But look at that amazing cutaway where it shows where the alcohol goes down. It's pumped back up and cools, you know, cools the, 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 um, the, the chamber 
and preheats the fuel. I mean, it's, it's just brilliant. So, you know, you've got to give him credit. Uh, does, does, uh, does he have controversy? Sure. I've read Annie Jacobson's book on Paperclip. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's a very good book. Brings out a lot of really bad things about the German scientists. But um, let's face it, he worked for us. You know, he worked for us at a time that we did need him. Uh, Tom Crouch, Dr. Tom Crouch, curator of National Air and Space, famous, you know, Wright Brothers expert. He stood at my unit. Tom's a friend of mine. He came to speak at NASIC, and he, he had a picture of Von Braun. He goes, we would have never made it to the moon without, you know, this guy. So, so yeah, here we go. This is what he came up with. And, of course, the, the, the requirements, really 1938, 39, uh, they had been working on, on earlier aggregates. This is aggregate 4. A4, V2, V2, Vergeltenswaffe 2, right? Vengeance Weapon 2, Vergeltenswaffe 1 und Vergeltenswaffe 2. So that's where the V comes from, but they call it the A4, mainly. Uh, aggregate 4, or fear. And so here it is. I know this is, this is too small for most of you guys to agree, but it was a, yeah, I don't know if this is any. Any better? No, probably not. But, <laughs> but understand, understand the the things that you have to accomplish if you want to send <coughs> a ballistic missile from you know or the continental Europe into London or continental Europe to continental Europe. That was most of them, right? Most of them went to Paris and Antwerp. Most of them went to Antwerp. But more than London. More than London. It killed far more people there too, but more more on that later on. You know, you've got to have a guidance system, and they this the guidance system, of course, inertial. Um, they did have a radio guidance system as well. About twenty percent of the of the shots were were um, you know guided by by radio, but the inertial guidance was. Gyroscopes, right? You know, you've got you've got two gyroscopes and you've got a pig, uh, pendulous integrating the gyroscopic accelerometer. A little about me: I'm a Minuteman II missile there. Uh, I, so I, I am a missile guy. Whiteman, back in the day, ILCS. You know, for those of you that know what that means. Um, so I, I was a Minuteman II combat crew commander. That's where I got my master's degree in history. Mother Sack paid for it. Amen. Um, <laughs> So I thought, I thought LeMay was his father, not a mother. <laughs> <laughs> and that's mother when, 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 when LeMay was alive, it was the father. Um, all right, so you have to overcome guidance. You've got to overcome supersonic flight. You know, these guys, supersonic flight is, is, is a major thing. Uh, we've talked about the turbo pump. Briefly, you know, getting this fuel down here and pooping it out and lighting it, you know, <laughs> fast enough to give you uh, the thing weighs 14,000 pounds, right? So you're going to need 50, 60,000 pounds of thrust. It was about 60, 60,000. Yeah, so that, pounds. what now? 40,000. Was that 40,000? Yeah, it was a missile. 24,000 lift off, and yeah. it would have been. Probably like 20% more. Oh, okay. You know, uh, one thing, when you go to read on the YouTube, there's numbers all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's funny, this, the standard number is 8,300 pounds of ethanol. Up here, ethanol in the water, about 75% ethanol, alcohol, mixed, and they probably did it. And then you've got liquid oxygen. Right? So, you know, you're, 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 you're loading this thing with, with alcohol and, and locks, and then and, and you got to pump that thing. you got to get this thing right fed, this monster you're creating down here in the combustion chamber. Uh, you got to feed it, and that's where that amazing uh, steam turbine pump uh, propelled by hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate, which is... 
any 163. It's, it's, Z, it's T stop T-stop and Z stop. Yeah. Right? It's any 163A. Thank you. <laughs> the, B used, the B used the more complicated system. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, you know, you take a dropper of one and you put a dropper of the other one. I mean, it's, it's you know, hypergolic to the max. And so you're dealing with some really nasty material just to pump the stuff. All right, so, and then you've got to control it. What's cool with this? You know, they, they develop these graphite internal fins. There's these fins and these fins. And they developed uh, these graphite fins to go on the nozzle, and that's what controls it initially until it gets aerodynamically fast enough to where it would switch over to the outer fins. And that is so far ahead. Remember, guys, when we took this stuff, and we grabbed Von Braun and company, and we grabbed all the stuff and we brought it back here. We jumped, and I have read some assess that we jumped about 15 years into the future. I don't know. What do I you think, think we had pretty sharp guys out in California. All right. Yep, but then, Vanguard? I think I think we picked up maybe <laughs> five years. Maybe five years. Maybe five years. All right. So they were smart enough. <laughs> so, you, you've got you, you've got a lot of things to overcome. So the first test flight uh, happens, the first first successful test flight, 3 October 1942. That's the one where General Dornberger says, we have gone into space, you know. And it's 52, it's 52 miles. The spaceship is born. And, and it, it, was, it was an amazing accomplishment, really. This is 42. When does the thing get in combat? 44, right? I mean, they, they ain't ready to go for two more years because they, they began experiencing all kinds of challenges during, during their testing at one of the test shots. Okay, you guys know this. Why is it black and white? Roll. So they could watch it roll. So they could film it and they could figure out what the roll rate, roll rate, roll rate was. And, and you know what? Yeah, I, honestly, until I started doing that, I could have not an answered a kid. Why is it black and white? You know? Uh, I learned um, that it's, it's to be able to judge its role. And you think about those wonderful German spinners. On the BF 109s and the Fock Wolves, you know, where where they would have the, the black and white spinner, Time zone. and, and so it makes it look really cool. And it's a German thing, but um, but there, this is a good shot of the Mauerwag, and here's the here's the little the little platform we will uh, talk about here later. But anybody hear the story of the time that one almost killed Von Braun? He goes down range, right, because they had mid-air breakup. So they go down range. I think. Okay. Anyway, they go down range in Poland. They're down range from Blizna, and and they're they're like looking up and they're seeing the thing come in, and it exploded like like a hundred meters away. I mean, this and this thing makes a thirty foot deep hole. So I mean, that, it must have shaken <laughs> this building. Their the theory was they figured the way the test had been going, the ground zero was the safest place. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing. So <laughs> were you guys ever ever <laughs> what CEP was for this thing? Mm -hmm. Seven to eleven miles. <laughs> wow. Seven to eleven. Miles. <laughs> and, and you know what's interesting? But is, wasn't is that, that consistent? That, is that they did launch them at the Remagen Bridge and yeah. came close. So but, I think they improved that. But the ones in London, does that CEP include the offset due to the bad intel that they fed the Germans? <laughs> yeah. You know what? That, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but that's, that might. Because they really did. They, they, walked they, the they pulled them. They did it with the V1, too. Yeah. Using their double agents. Um, I, I'll stop the human guys right there with the V1 and the V2. Oh, and I, I'll talk, that was one of those cases where human really made a difference where they, they, you know, the, the double agent was able to send back bad information and the Germans believed the agent. So in the case of Garbo, Juan Pujols Garcia decorated yes. by both sides, remember? <laughs> Iron Cross, Iron Cross, and some 
M V E or you know some some big metal from uh, from the British. So um, the only spot, as far as I know, in history to ever be uh, decorated by both sides. But that that's a great point. Um, <clears throat> okay, Spitfire takes a picture of it in 1943. They're at Penamunda. Um, you know things were going on at Penamunda, and and the Allies, you know, they they just. Um, they didn't take it as seriously as they probably should have at the time. Now, when they see this thing, and there it is, right there, it says rocket, right there. And I think it's about 45 feet long. And you know, this one says it's trailer, uh, vertical object. So they're seeing the thing, and they're going, oh, something's going on. And then, of course, by August, they just bomb that crap out of it. The Royal Air Force goes in with 800 planes and just... Just, but they were off by a quarter mile. They bombed mostly residential. And they killed a lot of the Polish slave laborers. <laughs> they did. Um, they killed, well, they, was it Tile? Uh, yeah, they're in, they're in yeah the Dr. Tile, he, 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 he was yeah. one that was killed. But, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, they, they did a lot of real damage, too. They, they did some damage. Yeah. But, okay, so... Well, I'm sure they wouldn't have been upset to find out they were killing uh, the, the engineers rather than the test tower. Okay. okay, so you you got to move. you got to move it. And you, you move it down to Nordhausen to Middlevark. And Middlevark is just a nightmare. It's a nightmare, you guys. You know, you see the numbers. I've read 12, I've read 20,000. You know, I think it's probably more like 12. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it was, we're talking <coughs> way more people killed building this monster than, than were ever killed by it. And I think it, the most is like 9,000 people, you know, killed by the thing. And then that's, that, what they, they, they figured that out to be about two people per missile. Wow. You know, you're, you're building this thing, and between V1 and V2, it was twice as expensive as the Manhattan Project. Like forty billion dollars. I, I didn't know that. Huh. But you mean well, and what translates into oh, forty billion, billion, okay. billion right really? dollars? Yeah. Forty billion? I'm, I'm looking at that going, geez, that's amazing. Especially when Hitler didn't really he wasn't that excited about it until you know after he, he didn't think he really needed the scientists, you know, because they were doing so great in in, in in France, you know, in the Low Countries, and and um, yes, sir. I believe that the effect, what they were trying to do, is what we would call today as terrorism. Yes. The issue of a rocket coming out of the sky that you can't defend against two fighters and it's going to kill wherever it drops will put more fear in the enemy than trench warfare does actually. And you hear it after it lands. <laughs> I, I do this to my analysts all the time. And it's great because I'll have this loud, like these intelligence animals. And somebody, some, some guys are a little afraid to open their mouth. Some guys will say, and they'll say the wrong thing. But I'll be standing there in front of the V2, and I'll say, when a V2 attacks you, there are two booms. What's the first boom? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's funny because I, I'm in a class. I'm at Engineering Week at Affet. And, and a junior high girl sitting in the front row goes, impact. And I'm like, yes, you belong in engineering week. Because yeah. it's impact. And then you hear the sonic boom. And then according to all the guys who were around, you hear the whoosh. You hear, so it goes boom, boom, whoosh. But you hear, that they'll call it double clap. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, you know, double explosion, but it comes in, it hits, then you hear the sonic boom, boom, and then you hear the sound. Okay, so what did they say it was? What did the British government say it was initially to the public? Gas explosion. Gas explosion. Yeah. So, so they were later on, the, the, the public, when it was revealed, the uh, public uh, called them gas pipes. Yeah. Gas Call them gas pipes. Come yeah. Really? Oh yeah, we took a <laughs> gas pipe to that boom. I always um, that, that that's where. <coughs> well, at least 
in, in this context right, right. of being attacked. <coughs> Absolutely, sir. It's a terrifying weapon. It's a terrifying weapon because you, you go down the street. I'm going to show you some pictures here in a minute. And a block is gone. Mm -hmm. There are pictures that I'm going to show you that look like 9-11, you know, of, of London. Um, what happened in Antwerp, uh, you know, we'll get to that. What happened at the Rex Theater, the Rex Cinema in Antwerp. Um, all right, so initial, initial idea. How are we going to do this? The initial idea was to have hardened sides, you know, have a great big hardened site that you're pumping these things out of. And uh, did that work out for them? The, Brit the Royal Air Force has this thing called a uh, tall boy, 12,000 pound bomb. And it, um, it, it bunker busted it, you know, it, it killed it. So Americans come in and bomb it too. So, so we have to go with a mobile system. In that, they were incredibly blessed. Uh, you know, as an intelligence historian, let me tell you, fix sites. Here, I'm Mr. Fix Site right here. You know, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Whiteman Air Force Base, you know, Missouri. Mobile missiles are the way to go, and the whole world knows it, uh, except for us. I mean, we don't. Know. But, but what happened to our train base platform? <laughs> I'm going to get me started. I think I tried this mobile. I think it is. You're very wise. I tried this mobile. All right, so the, the thing is, this, this is what it came down to. Okay, let's put it on a monitor wagon. We'll hook it up to a great big, it depending on what they had, half track or a, a great big, like a like big tug. And you're going to tow it down the road. You're, you're going to get out away from populations, um, you got to have a firm surface because you don't want this big old round table sinking into the mud. So they're, they're going to be putting it, um, you know, even this, and this, this, this is a Dutch drawing. Um, this is pretty open, really, and, um, but it does, it shows that there are 30 vehicles that accompany the modern wagon, or you know, the company the missile, 30 vehicles. About a hundred guys. About, about hundred guys. About a hundred guys. About a hundred guys. Because you've got a lot of stuff to take care of. Yes, sir. If you looked at the Redstone missile, it had just about the same number of vehicles, right? Yeah. Yeah. And same, same probably the same requirements. Power. Uh, you got four different kinds of fuel. A stuff, B stuff, T stuff, and Z stuff. Uh, I'll talk about that here in a minute. But um, the thing is. You you've got um, a test you've got a test truck right you've got uh, a command a uh, four light Panzer you've got you know the basically the, the where, where the guys push the button you know I, I can see this is old Minuteman guy I start trying to turn a key here I'm sorry about that they actually pushed him they pushed the button um, but they would get it to where they wanted to go and then yeah I, I got thirty more minutes I'm good. Um, <laughs> and then they would gather around the trucks. They would put the table. The table was being pulled by the by the, the command, the command vehicle, the armored command. So they're going to drop the table, and they've got to make sure that table is sturdy, stable, it's in a good spot, right? Then you back the monitor wagon up. You take off a couple of the straps, and you you lock it to the table. And that's what we're missing. And I know I've heard, I don't know if any of you guys work at the museum, I've heard that the museum is thinking about maybe displaying that differently. And I, I think that would be awesome if they could find an original table and then like erect the modern body. And just like this. Just like that. Like, like, the one picture, like the one picture. But this is, that, that's pretty sweet. Okay, so, so you erect it. Um, Go look at the minor wagon. We've got one, one of three on the planet. Go look at the stairs. On the one side, there's, there, there are these um, steel steps that are welded down the side of it. And that platform right there, that, you know, it, it plops down so the guys can hook up all the umbilicals. Um, also, you've got, <coughs> you've got fuel trucks. And the first one you load, is the alcohol, is the ethanol. So you're going to put in about 8,300 pounds 
into this upper tank, and it actually will pump through. They'll hook it up to the monitor iron, and the arm will carry the pipe up to, put it in here, so they'll fuel it here. Then you bring in the liquid oxygen. You always do that because that LOX has got to go in within an hour. I mean, it's got to be launched within an hour because it's just stinking cold, like 183 minus 183 Celsius. See, or something like that. Yeah. Um, I've seen the project backfire. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where did they manufacture the liquid oxygen? Because it's not on site here, but it has to be close. No, you're you're exactly right. Because it's 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 evaporating. Yeah, it's right. The it's the going by by. It's on the train. It's on the train. I think they. I think it might have been on the train carried okay. on the train. So but you know what? Uh, gosh, something. in my readings, I know I've read this. The the book I I love. I love Tracy Dungan's book. I think this is available in the museum. Um, Tracy actually helped do that restoration too. So um, I, you know, if I'm going to tell you anything, there's a lot of great books. Don't get me wrong. There's a ton of great books, but I'm sure somebody addresses that question. I'm just not the guy. All right. So what's the last name, Tracy? Dungan. D U N G A N. Yeah. D-U-N-G-A-N. All right, so, so next you put in the liquid oxygen. Uh, at the same time you're putting liquid oxygen, you, you're putting in the hydrogen peroxide. And then the last thing you put in is the sodium permanganate. And that stuff, you know, it, it, it's, but, and it's warm. They heated it. They, they, would, they would put it in warm so it would help warm everything else. Uh, because one thing about this, and you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with a group that knows exactly what I'm talking about. Have you ever seen any ice on a V2 launch? No, the, they kept it. They had this, this, this pr protective layer over the tank that kept it from icing up. You look at it, Atlas, oh, Saturn V, mm -hmm. space shuttle, yep. right? I mean, you, you've got ice, you know, falling off of it. And the, 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 the V2 did not have that. Okay, so you're, you, you put in all the goods. You've got the, the gyro set. Um, you got the, you know, the umbilical hooked up. got power right going to it. They did have heaters that, that would, that would, that would uh, keep up, you know, internal things warm because you've got this massive thing of ultra cold right in the middle of it. And then everybody runs away. You got you gotta get away. The command vehicle would go about you know about three hundred feet, three or four hundred feet, and they they had like a trench. So that's what all those guys. You got a hundred guys. You got guys digging, fellas. You know you got guys digging tr slit trenches. You got security. You know you've got all kinds of other people. Just like with a Minuteman site. I mean it's more than just two people. You know there's all kinds of people out there working. And so um, everybody runs away. They would move the table, and then, I think this is interesting. They would they would got to put fin number one azimuth toward the target, so so they would adjust it, you know, and they would they would they were having to do all these computations to make sure it would go to at least into the area of the target, and then they, they would they would push a button and the liquid oxygen and the ethanol would gravity flow initially. So that's why when you see the videos, you'll see the thing kind of going, <coughs> you know, you, you, see, you see fire. They have an igniter, and I would love to see one of these igniters. They say it was like yeah, a pinwheel. pinwheel. It was a pinwheel, so it's like a, like a sparkly pinwheel. On a stick that was just crammed up the nozzle. It was crammed up the nozzle, and that's how you light the fire. It's um, <laughs> a common firework item that you can buy anywhere. And then, you know what, it makes sense. Makes sense, but that military part. Yeah. I asked one time. I asked, you know, being a, uh, I was an instructor at Minuteman. I asked one of my maintenance guys, "How do you light a Minuteman?" And he goes, "Gunpowder, black powder. <laughs> That's reliable. because it burns. It burns evenly. It's reliable. It works. And so they have a strip <coughs> that goes up in the middle of the solid propellant star. You know, up up in the first stage." And they light it with gunpowder. Yeah. 
the head and ignition pellets are generally compressed gunpowder. Do they light it in the front or the back? Uh, it has to be the front. I think the front. The light on the front. It's usually I, I, think, I, think, I think it did. Yeah. Wow. So All right. Roman Aerospace does that with the other stuff. That's the head and ignition pellet that they put in the top. Well, they, they, they go, hop, stoop, and they hit the button, and then the pump kicks in. So you've got 275 pounds a second, you know, <laughs> going from these tanks. And you do have pressurization on these tanks. You've got, you know, uh, nitrogen bottles here. And it's, it just, it, you know, it just blows that stuff out of those tanks. And that's when you see, you know, the fire and the thing lifts off and, and, and it's, it's on its way to, to, to the target. And you'll see it roll. And um, and those guys immediately start tearing it down. It takes them about 30 minutes, but like in 30 minutes they're gone. Um, Are you sure it rolls? Because oh, that's a good point. System worked, that's a good point. The only way it works is the reason you aim that fin is it's aimed like an artillery piece. I think it turned. And the, the way the guy. I think system I remember works, it, 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 it. They just push on the gyroscope cage in the direction of the target. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's only really like two axes. So it three. shouldn't roll. That, that it makes shouldn't sense. roll. That should make it make sense. Yeah, the ones that we see roll, I think we're water they're sand. messing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they're white sand. <coughs> but, I mean, they, they may have put a three axis statement. <coughs> Maybe some. But yeah. Well, but anyway. the thing, the guys are gone. Right, yeah. they're out of there when the thing takes about. Three and, a, three and three and a half minutes to get there. It's going to make speeds of about 3,500 yeah. miles so an hour. Get torn down and out of there quicker than most high power rocket launches can. I'm Okay, one of the things that you will see is that they never killed one. Once they started to set it up, they never stopped one. They were killed on the road, they were killed on the trains, but once the crew got in the woods, erected, fuel, launched, we never stopped one. There was a case, I think uh, Duncan talks about it in the book, where a B-24 ball turret gunner claims to that have gotten one. <laughs> He saw it come up through the clouds and just started laying down on it, and, 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 you know, with a couple of modus, you know, guns and, and it, it, you know, that's never, that's never been proven. But there was a guy that claimed a ball turret gunner. I guess it's feasible. Although, man, you'd have to lead that baby just yeah. right. Cause it's just the fact that you saw one come through, we'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> was that filed in an official post uh, mission? That is a great is that an question. official post mission report? I don't know. I because you think that somebody else in the crew would have seen the thing walk yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the first strike. <coughs> they go to war. And, you know, on 8th, 8th of September 1944, huge day. Um, Paris gets one. Uh, London gets two. One of them lands out, you know, misses the city. But one hits in Chiswick. And... Um, it only kills three people. I mean, yeah, you can say it that way. It kills three, one to 17, a lot worse to come. Look at the oh. You know, and, and of course, they're blaming a gas explosion. <laughs> you know, and it takes out a block, a city block. I'm sorry if some of you guys seen this. I'm like, there we go. Is that better? I'm sorry for you guys. Make sure everybody can see it. What okay. was the weight of the explosive and what did it use? Great question. Great question. 2,150 pounds is the warhead. But about 2000, oh, oh, wait, 2010 is the Amatol. It's a 93% ratio. That never happens. When do you have a, a munition that's 93% boom boom? Right? Usually it's casing. You know, if you've got a bomb, there's relatively little of it that's that's that that's explosive, high explosive. In this case, the vast majority of the amatol. So it's a ton, right at a, a ton but, of explosives. But half the energy came from the rest of the. <coughs> it would bury yeah. itself, guys. That was it's moving so fast. Go ahead. It would, it would bury itself in the ground. Well, I did. They used to 
Actually, you know, Hitler was the advisor on the fusing system for the V2, did you know that? When they showed it to him early on, he said, yeah, because he must have picked up, well, he was kind of a weapons nut. He, he read yeah. tremendously about weapons, and he probably was interested in artillery because he'd been a hero in World War One. And he looked at it, and they said, well, you know, it'll blow up and the energy of the shell and everything, and he said, no, it's just going to dig a hole. And they realized that, that a conventional fusing system was too slow, and you would lose the surface destructive effect by, by when the thing buried itself. So they had to redesign it according to Hitler's precepts. That, that, that sounds familiar. I, that yeah, sounds familiar. It's a dumb story. But um, that's one of those things that um, the V1 had fusing issues, too. There were V1s that landed. You know, landed and sat there, so the Germans had to figure out that they had to figure out, well, you know, this, this needs so good, right? That you, you've got to be able to, it's got to be able to go off. And so they always had fusing challenges. But there again, they're doing something nobody had ever done before. So, and, and the world, this was, this is right at the end. You know, this is the worst in London, okay? This is the worst in London. This is... This is, um, this is the war. Oh my God! This is the war. It's 168 dead. This is right at, but um, in November of, of 44. And um, now, remember, the worst was the wreck cinema in Antwerp. Uh, the Plainsman Gary Cooper movie was playing, and the place was jammed with people, including a lot of servicemen. A lot of U.S. servicemen were at this movie. It was one of those old theaters that had, you know, balconies and, you know, like, cool stuff. Yeah. Have, cool stuff, like opera, you know, yeah. you put in there. <coughs> it hit the roof. Uh, it hit the roof and detonated. And and the story goes that, you you know, they would go in and there's all these dead people in their chairs. You know, they're just dead from, like, the overpressure, the blast. Because yeah. it went through that the, the balcony fell. There were people in the balcony that survived that had the row in front of them gone. Where, you know, they're looking down into the heart. Oh, 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 they're looking geez. straight down. And, you know, they just get up and, and, and walk out. I mean, it, it was horrible. Um, so 567 dead in mm. one shot. So, but then again, a lot of them missed the whole town, as we've discussed before. Um, there were there were ones that just totally goofed and came right back down on some you know Belgian town or on the battery that did happen too where the thing would go up come down buoy even though it was supposed to arm you know it would arm at a certain distance but um, just the even fuel, if you were it didn't go on just the fuel yeah. when you got all that boom boom letting those tanks it's gonna go cup out and it and it did okay. Whitechapel, this is the last day, um, 27 March 1945, uh, two of them hit London, but that was, that was the last day that London uh, was attacked. Um, if you look at, you know, one of these, which one is it, that one, that's the one that I, I think looks kind of like 9-11. Yeah. You know, you, you look at the, the beams and the piles, and I mean, it's not, obviously not as tall, but it's just total destruction. Mm -hmm. So this missile, this rocket, you know, was capable of doing this. Um, and they built like 6,000 of them. But they just did, they could never change. They could have never changed the war. Yes. It's ironic because it was built as a terror weapon. They knew it wasn't going to do mass destruction with what little warheads they had. And it wasn't going to become until the atomic age that they knew that it was <coughs> there. And they didn't have the atomic age parts. But what's actually ironic about <coughs> that photo and other stuff in, in World War II is the fact that complete incinerary bombing of a capital city in Japan produced more destruction from all the planes coming in than a single rocket coming in, but the single rocket, again, remember, it, it's what people feel. Yes. All these planes are coming, we're gonna die, okay? Uh, a rocket comes in and a few people are killed and it's like, oh my God, this is gonna be the worst thing ever. When the planes are coming though, 
you can get in the shell and hide. Yeah. This thing, yeah. you, yeah. you could be at Woolworths you buying your kid a toy. Away. You could be watching a movie, you know, on 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 leave. Uh, you know, having a having a weekend pass or something. And all they, of a sudden, boom. They did consider using anti-aircraft barrages against the B two. The, pro the problem was they calculated that the the rounds that, that didn't self-destruct would kill more people than the missiles <laughs> yeah. the anti-aircraft. <laughs> okay. So we ended up getting it. It was great. It was great art. And you no, guys, we, we, we talked about them. white. And there's the yellow one. There's the yellow one. This is the, this is the one. This is here at Wright Field. I mean, this is right down, you know, from the museum. It's really close to the restoration, right there. So, so we, we did have a V2 here. Yes. Why does it look so weird up in the front? It's a. It's right just here. a picture. It's painted brown. The whole thing is stretched. <coughs> It yeah, looks how fat or the aspect ratio is all wrong. Oh, is it wrong? It's okay. It, 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 it could be the way the, the video, the, the picture stretched. Yeah. yeah. Is it, when was that picture taken? You know, is that from close October to October? This one right here or yeah. this one? This one was October 1945. Uh -huh. You know, there's a very strange, weird V2 that's in the Redstone Arsenal near where they do the NASA SLI uh, student uh, trade shows. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's really weird about it, but it is a weird V2 with wrong fins. Does <laughs> <laughs> it have the scrubs Was it also no, captured German or we substitute it? You know, and that is, that's, that looks better than yeah. German equipment. And I, I, you know, you've got Werner von Braun, you've got these guys that know, and you've got a, a whole lot of money that's being thrown at this. And, and you guys understand, you know, this is what our missiles look like for a while. Um, we're going to talk about the Russians, what the Russian missiles look like for a while. It's hard. It was hard to improve on it. Um, we did, obviously. You know, Redstone. We're we're, we're gonna we're gonna go on from there, and so will the Soviets. Mm -hmm. But um, our uh, science fiction spaceships look like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you need to think about well, the the, uh, um, the Bugs Bunny and all the other ones. The, 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 uh, Marvin the Mar Martian. 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 His, his right. spaceship looks like that. Are, are these his prison photos? <laughs> yeah, when he was in the green line. You know, and of course, this this young Ukrainian who this looks, this one looks weird to me. It looks thinner. The fins look different. It was it, the charter was to build a V2 exactly for a goal for a starting point. Right. And Korolev didn't want to do that, but he was ordered to do that. And then with the R2, he started making those movements. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you've got R2, you know, then three, four, five was a good one. The, the thing is, he he just keeps getting better and better. And then we we come to the the, the part of history. Well, this is why, okay, <clears throat> when, that, when the, the middle school, Bellbrook Middle School, asked me to come, I, I wondered, what are they talking about? They want me to talk about V2s and early, it's early Soviet, the early Soviet space experience, you know, and, and I get it, you know, I, I, when I started researching, they are, you know, completely tied together, and yes, we are too, but we've got Werner von Braun, um, and a lot of people know about that. You know, a lot of people understand what happened here in America, but a lot of people don't understand what happened over there. And, and um, the R7, you know, you understand that, that the great grandson of the R7 is, is what puts U.S. astronauts into space today. Those guys on the ISS, they got there. On basically just a variant, sixty-five year old of a sixty-five year old missile. <laughs> Although they've upgraded and, the avionics. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Structure um, is still. The same. I, I, I got to tell you guys, I, I did have um, in, in one of my nascent moments. I I get these two astronauts. Um, and one of them is Chris Cassidy. Um, I, I get to take him through the museum, and that's just I just have been so honored so many times, and I, I spend. Bob Bankin, who's the head, like the head astronaut at NASA, he and Chris Cassidy were visiting NASA, and they're like, Rob, take these guys to the museum. I didn't know who they were. I'm just taking a couple of dudes from NASA to the museum, and they are uh, 
real astronaut. <laughs> Chris has got space shuttle, uh, space shuttle mission and an ISS mission. Wow. And just being a geek about this stuff, I'm like, what's it like? Right known as Soyuz, right? What's what's reentry? He goes, it's boom boom, <laughs> it's boom boom. Yeah, because you feel the rocket, right? The retro that fires when it's about a meter off. Of the oh yeah, ground. remember it's yeah. landing on solid ground, no ocean for the Russians. <laughs> I mean, you're landing on the steps of you know what Kazakhstan, right? Yeah. So it goes wham, boom, and they've got these chairs that have like springs on them. And, um, and he, he said, he said, I would much rather go into space, go into space on one of these, but come back on the space shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier ride. He said that. When you get on the, the re-entry on the shoes is very uncomfortable. He said, until you get under shoot, until you get under shoot, it was... It is pretty. It is pretty uncomfortable. But he only ever had to do it once. You know, he's he's done with that. It's a cramped. It's a cramped space. It is. Oh my God! In one, and I'm a fat man, and my knees are like all the way up here, and I'm like, take the picture. Get me out of here. All right. All right. All right. So, fourth of October, 1957. Understand, this is an ICBM at the time, launched to ICBM range in in August of 1957. This is during the International Geophysical Year, when all the world said, oh yeah, we agree, we're going to do wonderful things for science. And the Americans said, we're going to put up an artificial Earth satellite. I try to tell my, I'll ask my young analyst, what's a satellite in 1957? And you know, they'll look at me and go, it's a country, dude. It's a country. It's, a country. it's not a thing that flies around the planet, because you don't have that yet. That is an artificial Earth satellite. That's the terminology they used, you know, for a couple more years. But um, didn't the paper say artificial moon? Yeah, moon. Artificial yeah. moon. Yeah, that's yeah, right. true. Right. 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 Yeah. All right. In my documentation, like at NASA, it says artificial Earth yes, satellite. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Sputnik, you know, 183 pound BB goes up, does its thing. Um, I, I love to, to tell them, you know, anybody seen October Sky? <laughs> right? You understand that they couldn't see, they would never see Sputnik. What they were seeing was the third stage. And I've had my, my, uh, my, my space guys say so yeah, it was the third stage that was following mm -hmm. the 184 pound beep beep through, through, um, through orbit. So, what always amazes me about this is it's not so much that they did it. It's what they did next, right? You put up 183 pound BB, then you put up an 1100 pound woof woof. Within a month, within a month, they build an 1100 pound capsule that puts up Leica the dog. And then, as the guy giving the briefing, there's the kid that goes, um, excuse me. What happened to the dog? <laughs> they only had a month, boy. <laughs> they couldn't plan a re-entry for him other than something fiery. So, so um, no, they, they were they were going to they were going to. I think there was a system failure that killed it early. Actually, yeah, the dog was encountered the dog encountered an extremely bad environment and died. When the shroud came off, when when the shroud separated, this is what I remember. It, it, damaged the heat shield, and she just panted herself to death. Uh, yeah. She died within about six hours, if I remember correctly. They say like five to seven. That she died about six hours into the flight. But she was in orbit, yep. and, and they did it. You know, they did it. They put a living being up. Then, then Luna. Okay, January 1959. You guys understand, Gorlev starts looking at the moon. And he fires, they fire Luna 1 up at it, and they miss it. By like 3,700 miles only. And the batteries died before they got there. And, you know, the <coughs> thing is, that was a pretty worthy attempt. Then in September, they, they impact it. I guess I can leave it right here for now. They impact the moon. They hit the moon in September of 59. You know, two years. So two years after, two years after Sputnik, they send Luna 3 to the moon. It goes around, and I think it goes north to south, or south to north, anyway, it goes around the poles. 
and it uses a gravity assist escape. And it goes around the moon, it photographs the backside of the moon, it processes the film, this is 1959, it processes the film, uses a fly spot scanner, scans it, then radios the images, the scanned images, because remember, it, it's not like you're going to do digital pictures. No, right. not, not, not scan TV. You, you basically, you uh, process the film. You got, a, you have your own little machine that's processing and you know fixing in zero G, in zero G. Yeah. and then you're basically taking a real slow picture of it. They took 29 pictures, 17 made it to Earth, um, and there's one of them right there, dark, no, dark side of the moon, yeah. and. It yeah. just amazed me <laughs> that, that, that these guys were able to come up with stuff like this. They, they were doing great, you know. It had the capability of better resolution than that, but this was their contingency. They broadcast it quickly from the moon, low res signal, yeah. and they were going to rebroadcast it when it got closer to, because you're right, flipped around and whatever. And it was coming something back. Something happened. It ran the batteries. The batteries ran. Yeah. yeah. The <coughs> but, all right, so by 61, they're ready to send up a guy. Here we go, I love that picture. Yeah. And um, look at the look at this <clears throat> um, Something a lot of kids today, this is I was doing Space Fest. I was telling the kids that were coming by, Yuri Gagarin ejected. You guys know that, right? Vostok 1? They, they, didn't, they didn't rely upon him surviving an impact on the ground because they did not have boom, boom. They only had boom. It was going to be undershoot. The sphere was going to hit the ground. Boom. And so they ejected. He ejected at 23,000 feet. He comes down in his orange and white outfit, you know, lands and, you know, peace. I am, I am a Soviet citizen, oh. tells the farmer and his daughter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's lost dog. This is how he's oriented. There he's sitting like this. And so he, he ejects up like that. Um, it's it's amazing. Um, Which was against FAI rules. Yeah. Wasn't it? Well, well, they illegal. didn't talk about it. Only yeah, it was not right. illegal. The FAA rule or whatever would have, was a problem. Yeah. Yeah. They did not admit Mickey ejected to him like years later. Right. Yeah. And I know what? I think it was, it might have been Tereshkova, like in 63. Remember why they hired Valentina? Valentina's still alive. He's a pressure. She's, yeah. yeah. oh, she's died yet. She's alive. Okay. So Valentina, you remember why they hired her? She was a parachute. She was a she parachutist. Had like two jumps. That was she was a factory worker who was a skydiver. So it's like, hey, this sounds like it's almost like the right stuff, you know, when you see the, the, the acrobats. Hey, these people would be great. So uh, anyway, they're getting picky out of here. The thing is, Valentina, um, uh, she goes up in Vostok six. Six and she orbits the Earth more times than all of the all of the Mercury guys <laughs> put together. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, she's she was amazing, and you know, and this is this is one of the, there there he is. He's so proud, like a proud papa. You understand? He dies in '66 of cancer, and the, the Soviet space program kind of he doesn't go to pot by any means after that, but it's lost. It's lost a key member. And that key member, that the thing to remember to take away from all this is, is the Soviets' advancements in that space really goes back to the V-2. The V-2 was an amazing piece of equipment. While you're here at the museum, go study it. Go look at it. Go talk about it. You know, look at the things that, that we, we talked about today. Um, and, and think about you know, where the Soviets uh, you know, would have been without where we would have been. Heavens, if we did not have Werner von Braun, if it had not been for the V2, that would not have happened. We would not have gone to the moon, of course. Mm -hmm. We would have built the wide of these heavens. All right, anybody have any questions? You guys have been very kind to ask questions during the time. Did I'm we, done. Yes, sir. Did we know Korolov's name back then? No. no. They were afraid we were assassinated. He was known as? The chief designer, right. and if you see the movie The Right Stuff, you see him like, ha ha ha, you know, and it's great. You see the bald guy laughing. Oh, that chief designer. Yeah, that, that's what he was called. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much.